What an unbelievable game in Atlanta. I cannot believe the Mets held on. Brandon Nimmo with a ridiculous game. We'll be talking about all of it on this edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. What a game. I don't even know where to start with this one. It feels foolish to go back to the first inning, talk about Julio Tehran and how his first start in Mets uniform didn't go great. It was just an absolute roller coaster. It feels impossible to hold a lead in that ballpark in Atlanta. It, everything working against you, having to see Travis Darno and Jared Kelenic at the end of that game twice, just knowing as a Mets fan that those are the type of guys that would ruin your night, and luckily tonight they did not. To see them flash on the screen, the graphic, the Braves have won 16 of their last 20 against the New York Mets. To know just the history of what you can pretty much call a one-sided rivalry, for the Mets to hold on to that game, maybe it's just a night, maybe it's just one day, the first time these teams meet up, that you can feel good. But I'll tell you what, it makes you believe in this team a little bit, and it was just an absolute crazy ride Brandon Nimmo, you know, this is actually a stat that I was going to talk about in my next segment, but you know what? Let me pull it up now because it's crazy how much this one game can balloon his stats. He goes four for four with a couple of home runs. His OPS went from 454 entering tonight to 819 in one game. And it was really him who kept the Mets involved throughout this one. You know, he comes up in a spot after the Julio Tehran blow up, which we all sort of saw coming. He got through the first two innings fine, but the third inning came around and it, it just did not go well for Tehran. He walks the first two batters, gives up a double to Ozzy Albies, which scored both of them, and then a home run by Marcelo Zuna to end up giving the Braves a 4 nothing lead. The Mets get a run back in the fourth inning. Uh, you know, Pete Alonso scoring from second on a hit by Starling Marte. Great call to allow him to score there. Uh, you know, having him. You know, coming in on a really you know, bang, bang play at the plate with Kalanick throwing it in and Alonzo just beating the throw. Every run counts. And right after that, DJ Stewart hits the Mets out of a rally with a double play ball. But you get to the fifth inning with the Mets trailing by three. Again, you feel like it's a long shot. And he hits a three-run home run. And all of a sudden, all right, you're back in the game. New ball game. Shout out to Reed Garrett, who has looked amazing in the early going. The best of the long men. Uh, you know, he got the Mets through that third inning after Tehran struggled, got them through the fourth and the fifth. So really just kept them in the game and it made it a late inning ball game. And one of the things that I talked about on yesterday's show was the fact that the Mets were not going to throw Edwin Diaz, Adam Montevino or Brooks Raley in four days uh, and five nights there. They're not going to throw them that many times in a row. That's why they didn't go to them on Saturday, three games in a row. That was not something they were going to do. Four and five is a very similar situation. So your bullpen basically amounted to Garrett, Cole Solcer, who the Mets luckily added. They needed every inning they could get out of that pen. They were smart. They DFA'd Johan Ramirez today to give them one more arm. So Solcer ends up pitching after Garrett. He did give up a run, but he got them three outs. <laughs> and honestly, when your bullpen's this tax, that was a good night for Solcer. They had Jake Diekman. They had Drew Smith. They had Jorge Lopez. So it's your B, if not C, if not D bullpen going up against the best lineup in baseball. It was always going to be tough, but man, every single out of that game was stressful when the Mets were on the field. So Solcer ends up getting through that six. Of course, it was Darno that had an RBI double to put the Braves up. But then 
Seventh inning rolls around, and Brandon Nimmo once again comes through, hits another home run. This one off A.J. Minter, a very tough lefty. He went dead center there. Uh, great to see Nimmo come through in that way. Two home runs, two game-tying home runs. And then <laughs> it was you know back out again with Solcer. He walks the first batter of the seventh. Deakman gets a huge double play ball, 3-6-3 from Alonzo. That was a great play in a huge spot. And then the eighth inning. This is where the magic happens for the Mets because nobody saw DJ Stewart coming through. I was, you know, on Twitter putting stuff out about how Stewart's got to be off this team. I saw a lot of other Mets content creators also echoing that. Why is Stewart still on this team? Give me G-Man Choi. Give me Var Mark Vientos. Give me anybody. But DJ Stewart. And of course, when that much energy is going towards one player, that's going to be the guy that surprises you. And it was Stewart. Brett Beatty was on. He got a base hit. I want to also shout him out for a dirt ball read to get to second base, get himself in scoring position. Really good base running. Beatty, just a new player this year. But getting to second base on the dirt ball read didn't matter because DJ Stewart hits a hanging slider, crushes it. <laughs> And gives the Mets the lead. And then it was Nimmo again tacking on another insurance run, which proves to be the game-winning run. You had Jeff McNeil walk after the home run from Stewart. Tyrone Taylor gets an infield hit. Austin Riley couldn't make a great play. Um, you know, Really made it close there. And then it was Nimmo who drives in the run. Eight to five Mets. And that would be it on the offensive side of things. Great game by the Mets. Put up eight runs. Most runs they scored this year. But... Those last couple of innings were just brutal to, to watch. Uh, you know, Jake Diekman started off that eighth inning. He walks Michael Harris and then comes Drew Smith for a 31 pitch odyssey. Really, um, you know, Drew Smith gives up a hit, so that put two runners on. And then it was that Darno Kellenic uh, duo that I talked about before. He strikes both of them out. Stunning. Did not see that coming. Here comes Ronald Acuna Jr., who has struggled to start this year, and hopefully those struggles continue for three more games. Acuna walks to load the bases. Then Ozzy Albies walks with the bases loaded to play to run on a check swing that we were all hoping would go the Mets' way, and it didn't. Drew Smith gets ahead of Austin Riley, and then a ground ball hits a Brett Beatty. And again, if this was Beatty of last year, who knows if he fields that cleanly, if he makes a good throw to second, but he's playing confident. He fields it no problem. Yes, it was a routine play, but it was also a routine play with the bases loaded in Atlanta in those circumstances. So a big one for Beatty to make and the Mets get out of that jam. And then we all knew, all right, it's going to be Jorge Lopez. If Edwin Diaz was available, he would have come on in that eighth inning to bail them out of that crazy jam. It was Lopez's ninth inning. There was no one else coming in that bullpen. And so here you are with pretty much your last available reliever to get the Braves out, and every ball was hit hard. You know, Matt Olson, opposite field double to start things off for the Braves. Then Marcelo Zuna hits a ball, a towering fly ball, that I'm sure every Mets fan like myself was like, yep, that, that's gone. There's no way that's not. All the excitement's going to dissipate in the, the blink of an eye. But no, Tyrone Taylor makes an outstanding catch. It wouldn't have been a home run, but it probably should have been a double off the wall that scored Olsen. Fantastic catch by Taylor to get the Mets a much needed out. Then Michael Harris comes up, promptly gets a base hit, drives in Olsen anyway. Eight to seven, Mets up by one. Harris steals second base. By the way, Jeff, come on, what are you doing? I, I just have to say it. Jeff McNeil saying the Mets got him out. You got to review it. It's like, come on, dude. A little bit look at me. He was clearly safe. But the Mets were fortunate. Orlando Arcia, who's been you know, maybe the hottest hitter in that Braves lineup so far this year, he's hitting like 400 going into that at bat. He pops out, and then it's Darno. And again, Travis Darno was the guy that we all thought, we've seen this story before. We've seen Darno kill the Mets, and he's just going to do it again in that stinking Braves uniform. And luckily, for one night, the luck was on the Mets' side because he did scorch one. I mean, Jorge Lopez gets the save, but he didn't save anyone from, from anything tonight. It was you know, the Mets getting some fortunate balances for sure between Taylor making that catch to start the inning from Arcia getting under one and popping out. And then Marte 
making the catch in right center field, and the Mets somehow hold on to win that game. That might be the only game they, they win against the Braves all year, and we'll always have the memories. So much fun, though, to, to go through that journey and to see the Mets come out the other side with the W. And you know what? There is a lot of signs of optimism. This is a team that's now won four or five that looks a lot better, that will have a fully rested, you know, ready-to-go bullpen tomorrow. Maybe they can hold on to one of those guys, um, whether it be Diaz, Rayleigh, or Adovito. So they have another one if they have to exhaust some of those late-inning options in tomorrow's game. But they got a chance there to win a series in Atlanta. Uh, what I want to talk about next, a little bit more on Brandon Nimmo's breakout and just some other sort of notes on how this team is coming together. And then we'll close the show sort of previewing out the rest of this series. Before we get to that, though, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. If you want to go to a baseball game this time of year, Game Time is the place to go. They're running a special promotion for all users where you get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more. So if you've already used Game Time, this is not just for first-time users. It's for all users. Why I love Game Time is because I can see my seat before I arrive, so I know what to expect. I know my exact sight lines looking at the field. Uh, you can also get all-in pricing up front, so no hidden feeds that will surprise you. Game Time it takes all the guesswork out of buying tickets. If you want to go to a Mets game coming up soon here, take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time for a limited time. All users, again, get $20 off any MLB purchase of $150 or more in the Game Time app with the code First Pitch. Again, terms apply. That's code First Pitch for $20 off from March 25th to April 14th only. Down the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So I mentioned my uh, top stat here that was going to lead off this segment earlier because it still blows my mind. So I'll, I'll reiterate it. Brandon Nimmo improved his OPS from 454 to 819 in one game. He goes four for four with two home runs, five RBIs, and all of a sudden Brandon Nimmo has not struggled this season. It all went away. The funny thing is for just baseball today, we published a story. Um, shout out to our guy Tim Kelly who – uh, covers the Phillies also for Phillies Nation, uh, has for a long time. Um, he wrote a story about five uh, veterans who have struggled to start the year. And Brandon Nimmo did not belong on that list. And as the editor, I could have removed him, um, you know, but I don't really try to, you know, stifle my writers like that. So I, I let it slide. I was like, all right, Nimmo is struggling. That's fine. Um, it was a list that included Chris Bryant, Javi Baez. Uh, who else was on that list? Anthony Rendon, I can't think of the, the fifth name, but again, a list that Nimmo did not belong on because it was sort of projecting out potentially the, the fall off for some of these guys, guys who you know, in some cases have already fallen off and just are continuing that. For Nimmo, I was like, you know what, fine, we'll leave it in there, the last name on the list. And it came right to my mind during this game because I'm like, here we go, little jinx in an article can come back and help the New York Mets. What a game by Brandon Nimmo. I didn't feel like he had too many horrible at bats in that series against the Reds. I felt like it was turning, you know, started to draw some walks. Uh, you know, there was that one game where he drew three walks and I don't think he scored on any of them, but was drawing a lot of walks, showing that plate discipline. You thought a breakout was going to come. Brandon Nimmo is too good of a hitter to not eventually figure it out. You know, I talked about this before the season, breaking down how Nimmo is one of the most underrated players players in baseball, one of the most underrated hitters on this Mets team, you look at his career and we talk a lot on this show about WRC plus that is weighted runs, creative plus measures hitters on a league average of hundred. This is a stat that tells us how good a hitter is compared to that league average. So you look at Nimmo's career, go back to 2018, his breakout season. He had a 148 WRC plus 2019 dealt with a neck injury was awful to start when he was playing through it, came around down the stretch. He had a 115 WRC plus 2020, 149, 2021, 135, 2022, 133, and then last year, 130. So he has consistently been about 30 to 40% better than your league average hitter. His WRC plus for his career is 132. That number right there, when it comes to the consistency, may, means he's a better hitter than Pete Alonso, than Francisco Lindor, than Jeff McNeil. 
Brennan Nimmo is the best hitter on the Mets, and you don't really say that often, but when it comes to consistency, that's what this guy brings. In the last two years, he has hit exactly 274. He's gotten on base over a 360 clip, and then last year he added eight home runs to his total from 2022 or from 16 to 24, showing a newfound power that I think is going to continue, and tonight is evidence of that. When Brennan Nimmo gets his pitch, he knows how to handle it and drive it now and put it in the seats. And so I wouldn't be surprised if there's a 30 home run season in Brandon Nimmo's future, or if he at least consistently hits 25. So a much needed game from Nimmo. And without him, I mean, this thing's not even close. Brandon Nimmo drives in five of the eight runs, just massive. And you know, what's funny about it. First start in center field. And he erupts like this, not saying that that is exactly why he ended up breaking out. But if I was the Mets, would I mind throwing him back out there in center field and starting Tyrone Taylor and left tomorrow? Why not? I mean, Harrison Bader has not gotten off to a great start. It's funny because it, during the, the, the off season, when the Mets signed Bader, I didn't like the move initially. And then I talked myself into it, but the guy that I always wanted the Mets to get was Michael Taylor, not Harrison Bader. And Michael Taylor's hitting 429 this year, but you know, Bader has not shown the ability to hit righties in particular just yet. I wouldn't mind making him a platoon bat and sort of, you know, putting Nemo in center field a little bit more here j just to see what happens. Because also you can slide McNeil into left. Eventually you might get to a point where uh, Luis and Helicuna is ready to go and be the starting second baseman. In that scenario, the best version of the Mets of the season might just be Acuna at second, McNeil in left, Nemo in center, and Marte in right or even if Jet Williams is ready. So it's just something to, to put on the back burner. I imagine we'll still see a lot of Bader and even Taylor and center with Nemo on left. But the bottom line is this was a huge game from Brandon Nemo. And whatever can keep that confidence rolling would be a really good thing for the Mets because they need him to be this guy. Not the guy that hits two home runs, but the guy that has an 819 OPS. And in one day, he went, again, from an OPS of 454 to 819 that is ridiculous stuff and now just maintain that be the 800 ops guy for the rest of the year and the mets will be fine now another thing that i think is clear at this point is lindor and alonzo are not doing it for the mets but just like nimmo just broke out i still feel like that's coming from these guys i, I imagine at some point they have to have that positive regression to the mean there's a reason that these guys by the end of most seasons are putting up you know, relatively consistent numbers alonzo is going to get his 40 and if he hasn't hit him yet, that means they're coming. Lindor's going to get his 25 to 30 on the home run side, and he's going to get that OPS over 750, closer to the 770, if not 800 range. That's going to happen. So I, I think knowing that those breakouts are coming after seeing Nemo break out this way, and then, of course, the progression of Alvarez and Beatty this year. Again, Beatty, three for five tonight, hitting 333, got an OPS over 800. Alvarez has tapered off, but still overall has put up good numbers this year. And I think, you know, he'll get hot again real soon. And then Starling Marte looks like Starling Marte. So what I'm seeing with this Mets team that makes me confident that they can actually sustain this a little bit and be a winning baseball team this year, it's adding Beatty and Alvarez into the fold, knowing that at some point, like we saw tonight, those consistent stars and Nemo, Lindor, and Alonzo are going to produce and the fact that Starling Marte looks really good, well, now you've got a nice core. And if you add J.D. Martinez into this equation at some point, all right, the Mets can be cooking with gas. And you know what? Jeff McNeil, solid game for him as well. One for two, couple runs scored, couple walks. Maybe it was good to get him out in the outfield for one. Who knows? Um, and, and I also will note, I, I've loved the baseball I've seen from Tyrone Taylor. Get this guy in the lineup more. Um, I want to see him starting over Harrison Bader in, in a lot of situations now. Uh, the, the catch he made tonight, um, he's been getting, you know, some clutch hits at, at certain points as well. Had the game winning hit, of course, the other night, the walk off. So I, I like Taylor. Um, I, I'm still questionable here on sort of the, the, the bench and Bader and that third outfield spot in general. So maybe it is Taylor that steps in. Um, but then also you still have the DJ Stewart question marks tonight. He hit a hanging slider and it was amazing. Hopefully that can spark something. I mean, the reason why the Mets like DJ Stewart is his ability to draw walks, and we've seen that a little bit, and his ability to drive the baseball. He's had some center cut pitches before this on fastballs, 
that he's you know hit a double play ball tonight on one. Um, I think there was an, another game where I spotlighted one as well, where he he grounded out or popped out on a pitch that was right down the plate. I'm still concerned about how bad he has looked against velocity. A hanging slider is a little bit different for him, but still it was good to see. Maybe that will give him some confidence moving forward and you'll get some better at bats out of him when he's in the lineup until you get J.D. Martinez back. But that's really that missing piece. When you get Stewart out, you put Martinez in, I think a lot of these other issues will sort of figure themselves out. You won't need to play Bader as much if Taylor is still the hot hand because you're going to be playing Marte and Nimmo pretty much every day in the outfield. They're not going to be clogging up DH at bats, not leaving two spots that you'll need to have Bader and Taylor in the same lineup at times like we've seen early this season. And, you know, I just imagine that the Joey Wendell, Zach Short, that part of the bench probably doesn't get into a lot of games when you do have a lot of these guys that should be playing every day, just like Beatty has grabbed that third base spot. So I think this starting lineup has a chance to be really good and be much better than what we've seen up to this juncture in the season. You felt a little bit of a breakout coming from the way they played in Cincinnati, particularly the last two games. And then now this was a huge offensive explosion. It came courtesy of Brandon Nimmo, but there's no reason that the next one can't come courtesy of Francisco Lindor like he led the Mets on Sunday or Pete Alonso is due to break out very soon here. So maybe it is Alonzo that carries the Mets to a win in one of these games this series. And you never know. Maybe the Mets can shock the Braves and win a series in Atlanta. Now you just got to take two more. It turns into a three-game set. Try to win two out of three or at least just win one more and you get a split. And Any Mets fan before tonight would have been thrilled with that outcome. So I, I think this was um, an amazing start to what's going to be an exciting series, one that you're going to have to sit on the edge of your seat the entire time because the Braves will never be out of any of these games. But if the bullpen's rested moving forward, which it should be, at least it should be as nerve-wracking as tonight was. I'll preview the rest of the series, the pitching matchups ahead and everything else in just a minute. First, though, today's episode is brought to you by Prize Picks. Prize Picks is America's number one fantasy sports app with more than 3 million members. It is the easiest and most exciting way to get in on the action while you watch your favorite sports and players. You just pick two or more players and go more or less on their stats and watch the winnings roll in. Now that the baseball season is here, you can actually look at strikeouts, RBIs, first inning runs, pick more or less, add them to your prize picks entry. Before this season, I actually remember telling you about the season stats. Now you could have grabbed Brandon Nimmo on, it was 0.5. You could have taken more than that on his multi-home run games for the season. So any of you who made that prize picks entry, you just cashed in tonight. That's great. Uh, you know, with prize picks, you can also combine sports. So you can take uh, Jalen Brunson on points more than tomorrow and Lindor on RBIs. A uh, really cool way that you can play. Prize picks offers weekly promotions and special offers for the biggest moments in sports. Download the Prize Picks app today. Use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, download the Prize Picks app today. Use the code LOCKEDONMLB for a first deposit match up to $100. Pick more, pick less. It's that easy with Prize Picks. All right, so let's look at the rest of this series here. Tuesday night, Adrian Hauser makes his second start in a Mets uniform. Comes in with a 1.80 ERA. Remember, that was a pretty nice outing for him. Uh, his first time out against the Brewers, where the Mets ended up losing that game in extra innings, the first game of that doubleheader. He'll be going up against converted reliever Ronaldo Lopez, who had a nice first start. This will be his second turn through the rotation. Lopez, that looks to be a fixture. Uh, we'll see what happens with Spencer Strider, if it is just you know, a, a period of rest and recovery for him, or if he needs what we all think he might need when it comes to an elbow injury of this kind, where there is any type of damage to the UCL. But the bottom line is he's going to be out for some time. Um, you know, whether it's a couple weeks, month, who, who knows Lopez, who you weren't even sure if he was going to crack the opening day rotation for the Braves. He's there now. And, and so it'll be interesting to watch him pitch, um, see how he carries his stuff over a second time, a third time through the lineup. Again, the first time, that he started all went well. I believe he only pitched five innings, though. Let me check, uh, make sure I'm correct on that. Actually, that was a six-inning outing for him. Um, so you know, he went six. That was against the White Sox, though, um, his former team. Five strikeouts, two walks, one run on four hits. So we'll see what he looks like. 
Uh, but uh, that's going to be a, a, your Tuesday night matchup. Wednesday would have been Strider. I would have been Quintana versus Strider. Now, who knows? Although I believe that Alan Winnens um, was the player they added to the roster when they put Strider on the aisle. They haven't announced him as the starting pitcher, but I imagine he's the one that I'll get the nod. He has yet to make his debut coming out of the bullpen. So you would have thought that that's what they were planning on here, holding on to him uh, to make that spot start. I'd imagine Bryce Elder eventually joins this rotation. Elder was an all-star with the Braves last year um, in his rookie season. So I, I would think he's going to enter the fold again. Uh, but for now, it could be Winnings against the Mets. And that's a good thing that it's not Elder. Elder pitched on Saturday, I believe. So it wasn't eligible to make this start. Um, Winnings had a 5 2 ERA in six starts last year. Then again, those are the guys that in probably just blank the Mets. So can't say for sure. That the Mets have an edge, but you would sort of think that they got a little bit of an edge there on Wednesday night. And then the final game of the series, uh, day game, Luis Severino versus Max Freed. That'll be interesting. Uh, you know, Severino has not gotten burned by his fastball much this year. It's been those breaking pitches, but if they are there for him, if he only has a fastball, that's not going to work against this Braves team. They'll, they'll eliminate you know everything else. And, you know, they might be the team that does catch up to that fastball. So, Hopefully, Sevy could put together his best start in the Mets uniform when we get down to Thursday. Max Freed did not look great in his first start. He carries an ERA of 18, actually first two starts, now that I'm looking over the numbers here. Um, seven earned runs against the Diamondbacks in his last start off 10 hits. Went four and a third in his first time out against Philly. Didn't make it out of the first inning. Three walks, two hits, three earned runs. So, Freed off to a really rough start this year. Will that continue against the Mets? Um, I don't know if it's necessarily likely, but hey, here's the hoping, right? Uh, I imagine we're going to see Brett Beatty in the lineup again. That'll be a question mark when we get to Thursday. Is Beatty a no doubt about it everyday player? Because that would be the type of lefty that you would shield him from. But with the way he's playing defense at third base and the way he's controlling the bat right now, I don't know how you could start Zach Short over him. You know, so maybe Zach Short, you know, spells a Jeff McNeil that game because he still hasn't started since the second game of the season. I think he got a pinch running opportunity. Maybe he came in for a sack bunt one time, but he's sort of wasting away on the Mets bench. You know, they'd probably like to get him in there. Um, I don't know if we'll see Joey Wendell again this series. I'd imagine probably not. Um, that would be a game that Bader will definitely be back in the lineup. You would think against the lefty free, but uh, it's going to be a fun series. Okay. Th this game today was exhilarating. Uh, it was a, a great, great win for the Mets. And if they can find their way to beat the Braves in this series, it's just going to carry so much momentum for them moving forward. Uh, it's not to say, hey, if the Mets beat the Braves this series, they're going to compete in this National League East and, and, and fend for a title. We're in April. Okay. Uh, you know, going for a, an NL East division title this year still feels like an absolute long shot and not something that we can talk about for a long, long time. But if they can hold their own against this Braves team in Atlanta, it's going to give them so much more confidence. They'll then come home for a home stand against the Royals and the Pirates. And you want to keep the good vibes rolling because then they go out West and have to face the other juggernaut of the National League um, next weekend, starting on the 19th there. And that's against the Dodgers before they play the Giants. So it's a tough month on the schedule here, particularly – coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, so this was an amazing start for the Mets. They have flushed away that awful series against the Brewers. They're playing some good baseball. Let's see if they can carry it over on Tuesday night. I'll be back on a show that you can watch on Tuesday, uh, excuse me, on Wednesday morning, unless we get another crazy game that inspires me to jump on a live stream again. I appreciate all of you who tuned in live. Now, my dad he was actually watching this game on a delay. He he watched a movie with my mom tonight, and I called him up. I think it was the eighth inning, and he was still in like the fifth. So I got a call from him uh, about 15 minutes ago. I was tempted to answer it. Um, so we'll see where he's at if he's finished the, this roller coaster, if he called me with his heart palpitating with Jorge Lopez on the mound or Drew Smith, where I actually got that call from. Um, but you know, I'm sure he had as much fun watching this game as you all did again. Appreciate you for tuning in live here. Uh, for those of you who are listening to this back on the audio side or watching it later on YouTube, um, if you want to follow, rate, and review on the audio side, make sure you do that to catch all the latest shows. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button, trying to make a push 
to 9,000 subs. So I appreciate all of you who subscribe. Follow me on X at Finkelstein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked On Mets. And now that you made it to end the show, head over to Locked On Sports today. Check out the first ever 24 7 streaming channel on YouTube that covers everything in the world of sports. Of course, that is Locked On Sports today with our local experts like myself covering all of your local teams and our league wide experts covering each league. Find Locked On Sports today streaming 24 7 on YouTube.